Oh, fantastic. Now, was it you that was giving us the run around yesterday? Only took us 12 hours. <laughs> You see now why I was getting so confused because we were supposed to be right on top of the leopard and even if it was a flat cat we should have seen something. Oh fantastic. Okay I'm just going to pull forward a little bit because we are, we are actually quite a distance so I'll pull forward a little bit just to see if we can get over the top of that grass there. Seems to be too phased. Enjoying the morning sun. As I say, oh, I've got a flat cat. That's obviously why we didn't see him when we drove past. But with us being like, I think we were almost on top of it, we should have seen it. Even in that long grass, we should have seen something. Hello, beautiful. Oh, this looks like one of the youngsters. And again, in such good condition. Wow. Hopefully you can see why I was getting so confused. Hello, beautiful. Now quickly, I think that looked like the quarantine mob. So you guys have been following him a lot longer than me, so if you can send through your IDs and questions at wildearth.tv or hashtag safari live. Some beautiful light on him this morning. I just happened to see some the dark triangle underneath his eye, or what looked to be the dark triangle underneath his eye. Whereas his brother seems to have a row of spots underneath his eye. Now, fairly soon it's going to start getting quite hot. So I don't doubt this leopard's going to start moving at some stage. Stations Warning Way, South Gary Dam, Twin Dams Road. Oh, maybe not. Yeah, no, it is. Yeah, you see that triangle now. And getting confirmation from everybody as well. Oh, what are you smelling, boy? Oh, beautiful. There you go, Rosie. Hopefully, uh, 
for the shot that you need. <laughs> you beautiful boy. So thanks for that information, William John Birchall. I was in South Africa the early 1800s and collected, was it 50,000 species? Wow, 50,000 species. That's quite incredible. I didn't realize it was that many. Hence, there's so many animals. Ooh. Let's caught your attention, buddy. behind us that could be what is catching his attention can you just maybe just turn around and just check see what those birds are calling about because it could be they're seeing him and they calling or they could be seeing something else hi Colleen welcome on board this morning and I hope you're enjoying your evening dinner with the quarantine male leopard on your screen. It's so wonderful to see a leopard. Oh, I hope you guys are enjoying it. After 12 hours of searching, we finally found him. <laughs> Pauline wants to know, do big cats purr like the, the common house cat does? And they're not capable of it. Oh, nice. <laughs> The smaller cats uh, like the cheetah and serval do purr, they are capable of it, but the big cats aren't, there we go, it's just getting a little bit too warm. Way off to you. Hello, beautiful boy. Looks like he's actually going to the toilet now. Stations, Warning Way, Slowly Mobile, Twin Dams Road, close to Gary. Yeah, I've got this Warning Way close to Gary down. Close to Gary down. Pull in. Uh, he's, he's now mobile south. You can hear the squirrels picking him up. Well, he came to say hello, but he was also toileting underneath the bush. Apparently, it's going to be one of the places that they like to go to the toilet. He's going to start using those cheek glands to rub on the tree by the looks of it. It looks like somebody else has been there. Now it could possibly be that uh, the other cat was a male and it could possibly be that he ran into this male and maybe that's what you heard. It was the two having a bit of a standoff. See 
having a really good sniff there. Wonder who's been there. And look at that black tip on the end of the tail. I say, I've never noticed it before, but on the leopards that I'm researching, that was the first time I've actually seen it. It's right on the tip of the tail. Is that black, black spot? And generally, it's white. So, it's visited the message board. Where's your mother, mister? Look, oh, the toilet stop. Now you can generally guesstimate when a leopard is actually eaten, judging by the scat. So if the scat is runny and it's very dark, it contains a lot of blood, and that's fairly soon after they've eaten. As you get maybe a day or two later, the scat starts becoming a lot more solid and it may still be fairly dark, it may still contain quite a bit of blood but it will be a lot more solid and then probably around four or five days old or five days after they've eaten then you'll start getting uh, a lighter scat, not as much blood content but then you start getting hair and bone fragments. Now we know he's been eating yeah, you can smell it. <laughs> oh, wow, it is quite strong. If I can just reverse back a little bit, see if you can have a quick look. <laughs> you okay, there? Can you see it? I'm going to move my head out of the way. There we go. There we go. So, very fresh leopard dung. So, this one has actually got a lot of blood in it, because remember, he has had... A bush book probably finished eating some of it about a day and a half ago. Oh, slinking off into the bush here. Monkeys. That could be why he's slinking off. I think this could be who was around the dam yesterday. You can see he's actually holding his tail up, like, yeah, look, I'm here, you've seen me. Maybe you can see the monkeys. They're in the tree at the back. Coffee, no worries. And he is starting to send Mark. There's the monkey. I can see the monkey in the tree. Watching him quite intently this time. So if he's starting to mark territory, his father and Vula might not appreciate that. He might start pushing him out. But as we saw with the Umbidi Ordan when Induna started scent marking, he didn't push him out. So it could be... Can you smell the popcorn? Oh, I got it then. Slightly sweet, it's that popcorn smell. Oh, these monkeys are going absolutely 
wild in the tree. Welcome back everybody. I'm not sure what happened, but welcome back. We're still with this beautiful cat. We're going to follow him for a little bit, see where he ends up, see what he gets up to. Because also, just by following them, you do learn quite a bit more about the way they think in particular. Actually, we'll just follow behind him just in case because this bush does get quite thick. I wonder if he isn't going to go back to that thicket. He seemed to like that thicket. Oh, that was his brother actually thinking about it from Yuma. So for those of you who might just be joining us for the very first time, might not have met this boy before. This is the quarantine male. Oh, I just saw, I think it was a bush book actually, not just a head. You see that he's still waving his tail around saying, no, I'm not hungry. And he's not, he's, uh, unless he comes across an opportunity, he's not likely to do too much hunting because he has had a bush book very recently, so he's still going to be nice and full. And that will last him probably a good two or three days more. There we go, and he's changing direction again. The monkeys are still going, so you can see the distance that they're still, they'll still follow. Put that ran off. So he did just cut out that corner. So the quarantine male is the son of Karula, who is our resident female leopard in this area. And he is the fourth litter from Kar oh, from the fourth litter of Karula, his brother. Is, pot, is also around. We did see him a few days ago, Kunuma. And they're coming up for about two years old. She has had another litter. Uh, I think they were born around November. No, it might have been a bit earlier actually. Someone might be able to help me with that. I'm not sure how old they were thinking about it. Was it November? No, it could have been November actually. Texas, welcome on board this morning. Matt would like to know about the melanistic leopards, the leopards that are black. And the yellow fur actually has a lot of melanin, the, the yellow part of the fur, so they look completely black. But if you see them in the sunlight, they actually show the black spots. It's quite amazing. And Matt would like to know how common they are in Africa and have I ever seen one during my studying of the leopards and where I'm studying is supposed to be one of the hot spots there's two hot spots in the African continent and the hot spots are around where I'm studying and also uh, Tanzania apparently Kenya Tanzania way so we actually do rival that area for the number of sightings and 
the number of sightings is around 43 now confirmed sightings this is somebody's gone out and spoken to the people and they've actually spoken about what they've seen and it has been confirmed as a, a black leopard so around 43 in the last 60 years and that is actually quite a lot you might get one or two throughout the continent just popping up but they don't the amount of sightings you don't get like the two hot spots do but also we've now been getting a lot more of the strawberry leopard which is the opposite so there's not a lot of pigmentation so the black spots are brown and the yellow is actually quite pale now you can see the quarantine male leopard here those black spots are very dark and the yellow is this beautiful golden colour they really are such a pretty cat and he is in such good condition my word but his mother has definitely given him some good genes and it looks like he's got those pale eyes of his father as well and Vula's got blue eyes really quite pretty but you can see he's still got that cub feature about him when I first saw him he did have that cub face but as I say usually around two years old here in the sands they do seem to stay a bit longer than other leopards where I'm studying leopards they seem to leave around the year and a half mark but the leopards here seem to stay on just that little bit longer and as I say it is unusual to have the female have the cubs but what I saw where I'm studying the one male so she, the, the female who's dominant in my area the one male actually left around the year and a half mark. The other male was not very good at hunting and he stayed until he was almost two. I think it was a, uh, just under two years old. But she had cubs in that time. So I think maybe it does happen a little bit more regularly than what we, we realise. And it is almost this understanding that the cubs become comfortable with their ability and then they move on. So it's not so much the female pushing them away, it is this understanding. And I th it is almost like the males seem to tolerate them in this area, and I think that's what's happening on my side as well. Now what the difference is, is that where I'm studying the leopards, they fall outside formerly protected areas like the Sabi Sand. So these cats have been protected from the hunter's rifle for a good 50, 60 years. Whereas where I am, they can still get permits to shoot leopards. Luckily, the reserve, we've got a small reserve, about five and a half thousand hectares, which is not large enough to hold uh, the leopards, and no fence will keep a leopard in. So leopards do go over fences, under fences, even through fences. And that's what makes them the last of the free roaming of the big five. And it does make them vulnerable as well. But we're almost like a little island. And that area is protected and all around the permits can be can be uh, sought after if they want them. South Angus Kaya. Has been mobile static now. Oh, oh there's dwarf mongoose just up ahead of him. There it is. Just on the termite mound, just in front of him. I don't, I don't hear their alarm calls. I don't think they know he's there. Oh, it could actually be a squirrel. I just saw movement. It looked dark, but it, yeah, it's a squirrel. A squirrel. Yeah, he seems to have a a like for squirrels. Oh, 
Well, while we're in the stalemate... Hi, Andrene. Welcome aboard this morning. And Andrene would like to know if animals have specific alarm calls for specific predators. And some do. Some it's a generalization for any predator, but the monkeys have a dialect for aerial predators and ground predators. The uh, mongoose, the social mongoose, which is what I thought this was, but it is, it does look like it is a squirrel. I thought there was two animals as well, but I think it is just the one. But I don't think the squirrel is actually aware because the squirrel hasn't given an alarm call. As far as I know, the squirrel is just um, the same for any predator. But dwarf mongoose and meerkats do have some form of dialect. Oh, not quick enough, buddy. <laughs> he might just try and climb the tree, so... Now he's made his charge. <laughs> we'll see if we can get a bit closer. <laughs> But I'm amazed this, uh, this squirrel hasn't actually given an alarm call. That really is quite amazing. I'll expect it to be shouting extremely loud right now. See that tail twitching. They're just like your, com your common house cat. They can't help but show their excitement with the tail. Unfortunately, there's not much place for me to manoeuvre. He's just behind the termite mound. Here. <laughs> He's still trying to work out how to get in there. <laughs> ah, okay. Are you just going through the motions? I didn't see anything come out. But yeah, the squirrel hasn't given the alarm call at all. Oh, we've got another tail twitcher. I'm going to say that it was a little bit of a half-hearted attempt as well. But as I say, he's, he doesn't have to give a full-hearted attempt unless he really feels that it's going to pay off. Because he does have a full belly in of uh, bushbuck at the moment. He did feed on it. I think he probably finished it about yesterday morning. Apparently he was still there, so I think he had the remains of it. Hi, Jennifer. Interesting question. Why are the heels of the feet so high? And it is to help when they when they charging. If they have a very flat foot, it's going to be quite slow. So for an animal to actually run and run fast, they need very little contacting the ground. So if you think about ostrich, they, they, their toes have actually modified 
So they've ha they have one big toe and one small toe, and that allows them to run extremely fast. The same with the antelope. They walk, or they, they have the hoofs, so they walk right on the tip of the, the toes. And the hooves obviously help to keep those pressure points, or pre the pressure on the ground, very small. Just like a stiletto's heel and a big fat shoe, the pressure going into the ground is all on the one point, so it actually helps to... Uh, dig into the ground a lot more and just like the spikes of a, a running shoe it helps to keep them They're stable on the ground as well but um, as I say that, that you can see the amount of the foot that actually contacts the ground is very small and as I say just actually having that small area pressing into the ground just helps to give them that speed more than welcome found bring Furman's dip now the Furman's dip Let's say if you've got quite a lot of foot on the ground, you run a lot slower. That's why when, if you think about when we run, we actually raise off our foot and actually run on the tips of our toes. It's the same thing. And as I say, you need that pressure, the small amount of area, so the pressure is much greater on the ground. So the stance that the cats have is known as digitigrade. The digitigrade actually means that they walk on their digits. So they walk on the tips of the toes. Plantigrade means they walk on the flat of the foot. So we, we are plantigrade. So we have the whole of our foot plus our toes. And then you have the ungulates, which are the hoofed mammals. And they walk literally on the tips, on their what what would be their nails? There we go another scent marking there, but I'm not actually seeing anything coming out. Did the first time, but I'm not seeing anything now. Could get that slight popcorn smell. But it was very faint, so maybe that's why he's going through the motions, but it's not, it's not actually scenting, and maybe that's why he's being tolerated. So it could have been somebody else's scent that I was picking up, because it was very faint. Because I thought it should have been a lot stronger. Hi Faye, welcome on board this morning. All the way from Washington. So it'll be good evening to you. <laughs> and I hope wherever you are in the world you're enjoying our live safari this morning following the, the quarantine mail and just enjoying watching the behaviour. This is one of the things I love, is just following animals and actually watching their behaviour can pick up so much and understand the way that they actually think. You can see he's walking on the, the road, doesn't have to worry about wasting energy, bashing his way through the bush. And there are highways getting them from A to B and you can see all the way around him as well, they're nice and open. So he doesn't need to hide at this stage. But Faye would like to know what's the white for on the backs of the ears. Oh, he's seen something. 
he has he definitely seems to like the small mammals I think that there's a termite mound to his right where there could be some dwarf mongoose there could be another squirrel there Found, buddy. Oh, there's a hole there. Worth investigating. But those ears are very important in cat language. So when the ears are flat, and again, if you think about your cat back home, they talk a lot with the ears and the eyes and the tail the tail especially and the tail also has the white on the back so it's just to increase that visual language so that the, there's no mistake that white and black very vivid so if the ears are flat there's no mistaking it it's also possible that the white tip on the tail is for the females when she has cubs, the cubs can, they'll often follow the white tip. So as she moves through the bush, they just focus on the white tip and they can follow her. Now you can see his bed is not a, very extended, so he has been digesting that meal fairly quickly. As I say, we need to hunt for another few days. That bush buck's going to seem okay for a few days. But they are highly opportunistic cats. So if he does have to see something, he may he might just take the opportunity. That could be why you weren't smelling the popcorn, because it wasn't him, even though we watched him scent mark. So say it should have been a lot stronger than what it was. Now you can see he's keeping his tail very low now. Keeping it out of sight. go away birds calling. Maybe you see another squirrel. Wind is starting to pick up a little bit, but it's blowing towards us. So it's got the wind direction right. So the scent shouldn't go towards whatever it is that he's watching. I'm struggling to see what it is he is actually watching.
Are you giving up or are you trying the other side? <coughs> Giving up. Yeah, affirmative. Is Fran bring towards you? <laughs> so today he wants to be seen. <laughs> Just goes to show. So some days they don't want to be seen. I know, so yesterday was one of those days. Hi, Marion in Texas. Welcome on board this morning. Marion would like to know if the leopard has a plan or if he's just wandering around and it's difficult to say it looks like he has an idea of where he wants to go but he's open to opportunity so he's quite happy to see what, what smells come his way by the looks of it and again that is typical leopard And obviously this is their home, so they'll know that they'll have their, their spots that they like. They'll have the particular trees that they might like to rest in. <laughs> oh, look at that. Obviously feeling very comfortable exposing his belly. Just like your typical house cat. They will not do that unless they feel comfortable. Very cool. Good morning to you, Elizabeth in Minnesota. And Elizabeth wanting to know, has there been any update on Kurula's second and third litter? So for those of you who might be meeting this beautiful, beautiful male leopard for the first time, this is the quarantine male. And here's the fourth litter from Kurula, along with his brother, Kanyama. Kanyuma, sorry, I will get to pronounce the name right. So Kanuma and his brother, roughly for about two years old, and they were fathered by Mvula. But Karula's second litter was Mishun and Duna, fathered by Yambi Yordan, who sadly is no longer with us. Old age got to him. But uh, I haven't heard of where Mishun and Duna are. And Duna actually stayed in this area for quite a long time at least past him being three years old and we saw him interacting with his father and actually Karula's second lit uh, third litter Shivinzi and Shivambalana and that's who I was actually lucky enough to be witness to the mating between Karula and Yambili Ordan right outside my bedroom window and I only saw it because Karula actually called she made a contact call she walked outside on the footpath outside my room 
and I was so excited to hear what the the contact call. I looked out the front, couldn't see anything, and I looked out the side window, and it was just a mosquito gauze covering my window. And she literally stepped out from the shadow into the moonlight, probably about three, maybe four meters away from the window tops, and the male actually came. Stepped out of the the shadow as well, covered her, and she turned around and swiped at him, and then they were gone. It was just absolutely incredible. And then we were able to actually catch up, and then I think Mark actually caught up with them uh, on drive the next day, and confirmed it was Yambili Ordan mating with her. But uh, Shivanzi and Shivambalana, again, Shivambalana stayed for quite a while. Morning. 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 Good to see you. Morning. Long time. So? Oh, no worries. Do you want to follow him? No, no, I'll come behind you. It's all right. You can go ahead. We've, we've been watching him for quite a while. Yeah. We'll see where he goes and then, uh, yeah, we might, we might carry on. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to move forward a little bit. <laughs> yeah, we'll stay behind you for a little bit as well. <laughs> See what he gets up to. So Siobhan Balana also stayed on a little bit longer than his sister. His sister seemed to become independent very quickly. And she left the area around just over a year old, but we don't know what happened to her. There hasn't been any more sightings of her since then. It could be that she didn't make it, but uh, her brother did last a lot longer. But as I say, I've not, I've not heard of anything else. But you guys who do follow them, maybe you could give us an update, because I've not really heard much about. Uh, the older cubs recently. I think Mishu actually did go north and then he ended up west and I think he's now in the west around Nyati but I could be wrong. In Duna as well I think started spreading his wings but it would be interesting to know where they went. Obviously the sand is quite soft and relaxing this morning. <laughs> So we'll see. See if we can stay with him for a little bit longer for you. Hi, Kathy in Tennessee. Welcome on board. Just joining us. Wanting to know who this is. This is the quarantine mail. And I think this is the male that uh, was leading us on a wild goose chase yesterday. <laughs> but welcome on board. And it is wonderful to spend some time with this beautiful boy. And he's so relaxed. It is fantastic. So the quarantine male. And if you have a look down his back, I'm just going to roll forward a little bit again. Just so we can see that stripe that uh, Kathy's asking about. The stripe down his back. Is that normal of leopards or is that unique just to him and I've actually seen it a lot in leopards so there seems to be that that row of two spots and where those spots fall will be unique to the leopard but they do seem to form this stripe almost down the back and onto the tail but sometimes the the, the spots on the back are actually uh, directly opposite each other and very neat and sometimes they just offset but it does start around the, the top of the hindquarters and I have noticed that quite often from the camera trap pictures that I get of my leopards unfortunately I'm not as lucky 
as we are here in the Saudi Sands to see the leopards. I rely on the camera traps to be in my eyes. Occasionally we do see them. But I always think, well, I'm quite, quite glad they're not too used to humans. Because if they're too used to humans, then... Uh, unfortunately, the rifle will be able to see them very easily as well. So we'll see what he does at this junction. Because I still would like to head down to the hyena den, so we might just say goodbye to him at this junction. Gonna go for a drink by the looks of it. Okay, he's actually just behind that bush on your screen, but uh, won't be able to move any further forward. <clears throat> but Beth and Tim, welcome on board this morning. Beth and Tim were wanting to know It's just popped out my head. <laughs> Sorry, can you repeat the question? It just popped out my head. Ah, there we go. <clears throat> Do leopards have to worry about getting cornered by a lion or le or oh, hyena? And they can. They do have to be careful. <clears throat> but they're obviously extremely good climbers. So they will climb any tree to get away from the approach of a hyena or a lion, or approaching hyena or a lion. But uh, lions can also climb trees fairly well. Hyenas can't. Hyenas can't climb trees, but lions can. So if it's quite a thick tree and the lion has something that could want... Uh, the leopard has something the lion wants, then there is a possibility that they will climb the tree after it. He's just sat up. He's just heard something. I don't want to switch the vehicle on and disturb him. with the keys, just let him know that I'm just about to turn the vehicle on. Okay, it's actually gone back down to drink. So sometimes it's just that turning on the vehicle that startles them. Drinking. And great to know that you're all enjoying Andrew's camera work this morning. Hi, Emma's Gin. 
welcome on board this morning. See, we're going to see if we can try and get a different view for you. Can you see him over there or not? Mm. Nope. <laughs> it's too thick. It is just a bit too thick. But he's literally just, just behind the trees there. <laughs> oh, I love it. You try to get in front of him somehow. <laughs> That's usually the plan. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't always work. Let's <laughs> say so, you have to be quite careful, especially when you're walking down the roads like this. Yeah. So if you try and overtake them, sometimes they can get a bit spooked and you can actually change their behaviour and then they go off into the bush. small, maybe about 45. I think he's a little bit taller than Karula, but you can definitely see he's still, still got that cub look about him. Just see where he's going to go. Because you also don't want to block off their view as well. Because if you try and get in front of them too much and too often, you can block off. Because if they are looking for a hunting opportunity, you could potentially change that. I might get an opportunity here. Are you going to carry on? Uh, okay. <laughs> no worries. Do you want to go ahead again? No, you go ahead. I'll come. Okay. Just see. Vegetation opens out a little bit here. We might have an opportunity to at least pull alongside him. Kathy in Indiana. Kathy would like to know can cats how do cats drink or how does leopard drink? And it is lapping the water. They don't suck it, they, they do lap it. Another toilet stop. So I think I was halfway through answering another question, just as I was trying to get another view of him round by the water for you. But uh, female leopards actually uh, don't really need to teach their cubs how to climb a tree, it comes naturally. And they can climb trees from quite an early age. I think they already start when they probably about three three weeks to four weeks old. Certainly by two months they can climb trees fairly well. <laughs> you, would you want to go ahead?
Well, it's heading in the general direction of where the hyena den is, so we might as well stay with them until we turn off. Arquette in Arkansas. Welcome on board this morning. Hope you're enjoying watching the quarantine mail. It's really nice just to see some of this behaviour coming through from him. Here we go, he's got, <laughs> he's got his tail up again. Someone might have just seen him. You can see he was actually starting to go flat and then all of a sudden, no, I wasn't, I wasn't interested. I promise you. <laughs> Holding his tail high again. I kept wanting to know if I've ever seen a big cat jumping on the bonnet of a vehicle, one that I've been watching or another one. And no, I haven't. Not not here in the sands or anywhere else that I've worked. <coughs> and uh, one of the ways we, we do make sure that that doesn't happen, if there is a, a cat that looks... Look, they're too inquisitive. You can see they get very close to the vehicle, but you can still see that they're, they're very wary. But if there's an individual that's just starting to push those boundaries, you need to make sure that you reiterate that line, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing now. It would be too dangerous to drive around with cats that no longer respect that boundary with the vehicles, because then you would get a cat just jumping in with the guests and potentially killing them. So instead, if if you do get a cat and they start putting, say, the paw on the side of the vehicle, that's starting to cross the line and you need to you need to reiterate, look, that's that's not acceptable. If they're sniffing the tires, that sort of thing, that's fine. But once they start putting a paw on the on the vehicle, so either you, you need to um, say, hey, no or you roll the vehicle forward slightly, you just make it so that they, they suddenly realise, oh no, I don't like that. What, 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 what just happened there, I don't like it. But not enough to actually really scare them, but just, that's why either just rolling the vehicle slightly just makes them remember, actually, no, that, that's not a line to cross. And to keep that respect there, that's why we can have the open vehicles and we can follow the animals like we can, even with the lions. And also they've got enough food out here so they don't need to push that boundary. Yeah, there's, there's no reason for them to actually attack people in the vehicles. It's not prey that they recognise, it's not prey that they're used to. So they don't need to... you know, even look at us as if we're prey. Franklin's behind us. And it's nice to see the reactions of the animals as he's walking. There were some go-away birds that were in the tree earlier who didn't give an alarm call, but while he was drinking, they were giving an alarm call. Very interesting. Possibly because he was stationary, whereas when he was walking, he was clearly not even paying them any attention going underneath the tree. But the squirrel and the monkeys were giving alarm calls, and they kept giving the alarm call for quite a distance. So looking at something again. Just gonna pull forward a little bit.
Do you see his, his... Sorry, were you radioing me? No, I was saying it's when I move forward to the water. Oh, it's fine. We'll just wait for him to move. Yeah, my radio is playing up quite a oh, bit, so I, I'm struggling. Also <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Has there been any update on the Birmingham Pride? Mm, they, somebody said they were on the west last, yesterday. Oh, still on the west? Yeah, the update is that they're on the west, but I'm not sure which property. Oh, okay. Not Arachusa, but uh, I think west from there. Oh, okay. Yeah, and this morning uh, I think Matima came across back to the south again by Annette's area. Oh, uh, okay. And, uh, some of the two sticks, females. Oh, two sticks and yeah. two matimbas. Yeah. Okay. Someone was asking if Blondie came back to the Birmingham Pride. Because um, someone was saying they were up to five again. So has Blondie joined them again? Uh, mm, I'm not sure, but that would be great because last time uh, we saw them we four of them. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, so, so Blondie must have joined them must then. Been, yeah. Yeah. yeah, which is great. Okay, cool. So, yeah. <laughs> he's such a beautiful male, hey? Sure. Yeah. He's such he's, a beautiful cat. He's so cool, eh? <laughs> but, um, when you my, I don't, I don't see him either. We, we think we had him um, just as I arrived last week. Okay. And he was heading towards um, Inga's, Inga's house. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's beautiful, actually. They, they, they grew up strongly. Yeah, definitely, hey. So they're going to be around, I think. That's going to be nice. Yeah. And I think Karuna, uh, she was, was it you that saw her on um, the quarantine? No, yeah. They yeah. Right on where I saw you there, where I found yeah. you, right there. Ah, uh, sure. So she cut straight into the block. Okay, so, because I, I was looking around here yesterday and couldn't mm. see any signs. There's a tracks uh, from yesterday. But yeah, somewhere around the cut line, cutting straight west into position of Babusu Dam. Oh, okay. That side, yeah. Okay. So it might might be worth yeah, checking around that area. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and I heard about uh, Tandy's cub as well, unfortunately. Yeah, one of them get killed, and we still. I haven't... But no no one knows how, hey? How no, it... nobody knows, because it's a crime. How old was it? So, well, four months? About four months. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So okay. So still young. Yeah, yeah. And, um, what happened? They found the hyena feeding on, mm. on the cubs, but uh, then they don't. Nobody knows. Some say Ephraim said it was already sting. Mm. So probably I don't know what. Yeah. Because it, it got taken to the 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 Mbisi Kai, didn't it? So it, it got I taken to the Mbisi. Yeah. When I saw the, the footage, but um, yeah. I, when I, that afternoon I drive and you know, I went past by Mbisi uh, Kai, there was nothing. Yeah. There's only one Mbisi uh, lying down there. Yeah. Okay. Well, we we're gonna make a turn around there a yeah. bit later.